want to take a moment this afternoon to back up a little bit and talk about the theoretical basis for this ongoing oral history project that we've been talking about this fall. As a little bit of background, we launched the oral history project on September 4th as part of our in-gathering service. And from September 4th to October 16th, we'll have recording stations out and available during coffee hour. It's an opportunity for two people to sit down and talk about what the last three years have been like for them. Years that have been deeply strange. You'll have a recorder, six um, questions that are set, usually takes about 15 minutes per pair. There's going to be an opportunity uh, today uh, and every day between now and October 15th to participate. Um, but as we do that, I also want to talk about why this is important, why this project at this point. So one of the places that we start is where we are as a church right now. You know, there's some really good things happening at the church. We're launching a new congregational year. Uh, the day that I'm recording this, we're launching uh, age-based religious education for the first time in several years. Our choir is singing again. We have concerts going on. But we're also struggling a little bit with turnout and volunteerism and, and just feelings of burnout in leadership generally on, on the staff team, on um, lay leadership sort of across the board. And that's a hard thing. This feels like an opportunity, a, a time when there's a lot of opportunity, and also a time where there is perhaps less energy to engage those opportunities than there have been in the past. There's also a story that I want to start with about the Board of Trustees this summer. Judy Hart asked this question of the Board of Trustees. What, what is a thing that you have learned during the pandemic? And the answers on the board varied wildly from some people saying, I, you know, I, I learned that bad things could be happening in the world and I would be fine to folks saying the pandemic was terrible. It was terrible for me. It was terrible for my family. And I don't know how it will get better. And it was a moment um, with those people of, of a real realization that several of us are carrying deep hurt from the, the time of the pandemic and that that has an impact on us as a collective um, community. I would go so far as, as to describe the reactions of a lot of people during the pandemic, including myself, as traumatic, that it was a traumatic experience. So usually we think of trauma as an individual thing. There's this um, definition from Fisher and Rydesser who say that trauma is the experience of a fundamental discrepancy between a threatening situation and an individual's possibilities for overcoming it. So the first piece of the definition is that discrepancy. Trauma is the result of things that you cannot fix because we're really good at problem solving. In a threatening situation, we want to have some level of control over the problem, right? If I do these three things, I'll be fine. So think about the last three years and then the discrepancy in scale between the control we could exert and the reality of the world. This came up again and again and comes up in the oral interviews, right? <laughs> How uh, maybe, maybe I'll be fine if I have the right kind of mask or if I get this kind of vaccination or in the early days, if I have enough toilet paper in my house. When the reality is that, that those all might've been risk mitigation measures, but not risk elimination measures. And then the second part of that trauma definition is that this experience is accompanied by feelings of helplessness, defenselessness, and abandonment, and can permanently disrupt the person's understanding of the self and the world. That part's also important. It's not just that there's a disconnect 
between our ability to act and the, the world around us. It's that if we don't address it, trauma has a way of impacting us in very, very deep and lasting ways. So addressing individual trauma is pretty well established. There's a common account by Judith Herman that lays out three steps of trauma recovery. And the first is establish safety. And I know this is complicated right now in COVID because the pandemic is still ongoing. So establishing safety is a, is a contested issue right now. And then the second step is to mourn the traumatic experience. Judith Herman writes on the first page of her book, Trauma and Recovery, remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are prerequisites for both the restoration of social order and the healing of individual victims. The survivor tells the story of the trauma completely in depth and in detail. The telling the story is part of the healing process. Now Herman's quick to point out and, and most of her um, respondents since then have, have started to unpack the disconnect here between one of the, the features of a trauma response, which is that folks who have been through a traumatic experience often dissociate in some degree from that experience. They don't want to talk about it, right? The, the Ur example of this and where a lot of, a lot of the original writing is, is PTSD research where um, veterans had no interest in talking about their, their overseas service, no matter how traumatic it was, especially if it was traumatic. But the way through the way to healing is to tell the story completely in depth and in detail. And then the last step Herman says is to reintegrate the survivor into ordinary life. Well, so far so good. There's some things in here that are a little bit harder with COVID, some things that are a little bit different with COVID. Um, and it's not easy stuff, but psychologists, therapists, clergy have been working out how to respond to individual trauma for generations now. But what we're facing in this moment is not simply individual trauma. There, there might be, there probably are members in this congregation who are facing individual trauma from the, the COVID years. But there is also this other piece of it. Back in the 1970s, uh, there was a, a sociologist named Kai Erickson who was hired as an expert witness after environmental disasters. He started to realize as he was doing this work, he, he was originally studying trauma in individuals after, um, after mudslides and, and other, other disasters. But he realized in his work that, that while these events were traumatic to individuals, they were also traumatic to communities. And a really important part of that was that you did not necessarily need to be one of the individual victims for a community that you participate in to be traumatized. Right? Whether or not your house was caught in a mudslide, if the community you live in had a large scale disaster, the systems that you participate in from bowling leagues to local government to churches can start to exhibit traits that look a lot like a trauma response. So where an individual might express helplessness, defensiveness, defenselessness, abandonment, and a disconnect between self and the world, systems, institutions, start to see a drop in trust, a disconnection with the environment, apathy, less participation in community events. If this starts to sound a little familiar, this is because there's a lot of people saying right now, churches are starting to exhibit collective trauma responses in the third year of COVID. So that's where this project starts. COVID-19 looks like a collective trauma event. Now it doesn't map 100% onto what Erickson and others wrote, but that's in part because we haven't seen a natural disaster like this with a span, excuse me, measured in years and a geographic scope that covers continents. 
So if what we're in right now looks like collective trauma, then how do we address collective trauma, not individual trauma? What does collective recovery look like? Scott Alexander, another sociologist, goes right back to telling the story of what happened. He says that communities developing a narrative around collective traumatic events help that community to heal and to integrate itself back together, to, to knit the bonds of community that collective trauma fractures and pulls apart. He says specifically in recovering from collective trauma, communities articulate four different things. First, the nature of the pain. So what happened and to whom? Second, the nature of the victim. Who was affected? Third, the relationship between the victims and the wider audience. This is the really important part, the extent to which the trauma narrative prompts a wider audience that has not experienced the same suffering to identify with the victims in the community. And then the fourth piece, Alexander says, is an attribution of responsibility who caused the trauma. And that is a complicated thing when you talk about COVID-19. So the idea of this oral history project that we're doing is aimed straight at these first three questions that Alexander poses. So think about the, the nature of that board meeting this year, different experiences. Some people saying that the, the pandemic was not particularly traumatic to them and others saying the pandemic was horrible, that they have not yet recovered. The hope is that that's doing work towards that third question. So if we go through those three, we can talk about the nature of the pain in this community, who getting real clear about who in our congregation was hurt during the pandemic, what the hurt was during the pandemic, whether that was isolation or a lack of childcare or fear uh, for, for those of us with compromised immune systems, loss of family members during COVID-19. We also will talk about the nature of the victim. So having an opportunity for as many people as possible to say, this, this affected me. I'm one of the people that was hurt. And then this third piece, which is the relationship piece because the way one person was hurt is not the way that I was hurt. But I can understand how we both were affected, how even with our individual stories, our community, our church, has a collective experience and a collective narrative of this time. So that's the theory. The, the practice starts with these oral histories. So if you haven't participated yet, I'd strongly encourage you to. Uh, I'm playing this video for the first time, I think in coffee hour. Um, there's videos out or there's recording stations out in the gallery. I'm wandering around trying to find um, people to, to sign up. I would love for everyone in this congregation to participate um, because the more people that we get to share those stories, the more we can move out of this strange place we're in and start to develop a collective narrative of who we are in this time, who, who we were, who we are becoming. That's really important work for a church. And it's work that I hope you'll be a part of.